All right, I've got a few uh, giveaways that we've started to get. Kate Greiner. Are you here? <laughs> we were just at their table and she was admiring the gift. She's the, there you go. Oh, you don't need that, do you? Um, and then we have one more back here. And we're going to draw a few folder numbers while we wait to a few, for a few more folks to. So grab your folders. We'll give a few more gifts away. Um, I also have a Texas Roadhouse gift card from New Cara. Uh, Joelle Schmidt. Is Joelle Schmidt here? Uh, we'll, give her, we'll give her a second. Maybe she's out, out getting snacks or something. We'll give her a minute. All right. I'm going to find my box of numbers up here, and we're going to draw a few more. Not 92. And if I draw your number, you can see uh, Madison in the back, and she'll give you one of the little white bags. One thirty-nine. We'll just keep drawing until we get nine people who are one fourteen. Eighty-four. I'm one hundred six. I got it. eighty. Are y'all looking at your folders? Yes. <laughs> 63? No, still nothing? This is a really good idea in my head. I didn't think about this all the way through. 103? Yay! Yay! 73? Forty-seven? Fifty-two? Oh, did you win again? Yay! <laughs> Go get a lottery ticket. 126, 134, 10, 13, 85, 11, 9. All right, we'll draw five more, we'll and then we'll let them get started. Oh, okay, we got another winner. 86. 86. We don't get out much. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay. Oh, they we're all up here. Uh, Thank you all for joining us for this full day. We always end with some sort of panel discussion. It, it may look different from year to year. This year, again, we heard your feedback. And one of the things we've heard time and time again is, we would like to know about aging with brain injury. You talk a lot about what happens with the brain injury and the therapy after the brain injury, but what happens 15 years after the brain injury? What does that look like? So up here, we have Gail McGahee. She's one of our physical therapists and a clinical team lead for our outpatient program. You've heard Jeremy's introduction. He's one of our uh, therapeutic recreation specialists in uh, our long-term care. And Bree Kapos is one of our nurses in our inpatient program. Bree has a unique perspective because she's worked as a CNA and at our residential neuro home while getting her RN and now serves as a nurse. So I'm excited to hear what these guys have to share with you about aging with brain injury. Hi guys, uh, my name is Gail McGahey, uh, like um, Abby said. But first of all, I'm gonna do a couple of shameless plugs, just so you know. Up on the screen today, I'm hoping that you saw that there's a new outpatient building that's actually being constructed, and we are opening our doors June 12th. Can't tell you how incredibly exciting that is. But in that, we also have an open house that's occurring on June 15th, I believe from four to seven, and anybody is welcome. You've gotta come see it, it is amazing. Considering we started in a yellow house, um, modular home in 2011, saw 30 people that whole year. We got attached to the building in 2015, and we saw up to about 450. We are on track right now to serve 1,000 people PTOT and speech. And once we get up into the big building, which I call the Taj Mahal, once we get up there, 
it's likely that within four to five years projected that we'll be able to serve over 2,000 people with PTOT and speech. That's a lot. So come visit us, guys. Okay, so we're going to be talking about um, aging with brain injury. Now, when I was asked to actually help with this, I, I felt it was a little personal. This year I turned 50, and I was like, hey, why, why are we doing this? <laughs> this is not cool. But what we'll start off doing is talking about just the normal aging process. And also I do want to say when we talk about aging and brain injury, I really want you to think outside the box of that brain injury. It's not just TBI, yes, the acquired part, but we have to think about everybody. Parkinson's, MS, PCS, I mean everybody. So think really that global, and I'm almost going to think more so like a neurological infarct or a neurological deficit when I think about aging and BI. Agreed? Okay, good answer. Okay. <laughs> so, when we talk about normal aging, there's a lot of things that happen with our systems. So our cardiovascular system, our blood vessels and our arteries, they actually can stiffen, causing an increase in our cardiac workload. Therefore, we get increases in blood pressure. Our musculoskeletal system, that also changes. So our bones actually shrink in size and in density. Uh, we lose muscle strength. We lose our endurance. We lose our flexibility. Did I feel this this year? Sure. I got a phone call. Hey, Gail, schedule your bone density test. Thank you very much. Our digestive system. We also know that that changes over age as well. We have structural changes in our large intestines. Um, and that a lot of these changes, along with slow motility, actually lead to constipation. Um, we also forget to exercise at times, so we have lack of exercise, we don't drink as much, we don't have a high fiber diet. We do all of these things that actually can limit our um, digestive system, and it'll slow the track down. So things are changing. Also got that call this year for the colonoscopy. It's really nice. Our urinary system also changes. We lose a lot of elasticity within the bladder. Our pelvic floor muscles actually can weaken as well. And all of those things can create some urinary, um, urinary issues. Also in men, sorry, Jeremy, you get an enlarged prostate. So it does, it happens. So from a normal standpoint, I don't know about you guys, but I ain't jumping on no trampoline anytime soon. <laughs> Did that. Stop. Nope. No more. <laughs> How about you, Jeremy? I, I actually jump regularly. Okay. Yep. And it's part of the program to keep it tight. <laughs> oh, I don't even know where to go with that. Anyway. <laughs> We know that our cognition changes, things slow down, we, are, have, we have memory issues, we have just all sorts of need to move the slide. There we go. Forgot to do that. Um, so we have, we have changes in our executive functioning. There's just a lot of changes that, that occur within um, cognition. We also know that vision changes, hence the reading glasses. People shove stuff in my face and I'm like, whoa, can you put that over there so I can read it? The other thing that happens is we have hearing difficulties. There are changes in our hearing as well. Um, has anybody seen the movie Sister Act? Okay, do you remember there's a scene in Sister Act where Whoopi Goldberg always says to Alma, she, hold that a sec. she goes, Alma, check your batteries. <laughs> yeah, that's what the staff at On With Life say to me, these little 25-year-old whippersnappers. <laughs> it's disrespectful, it's just normal aging, guys. It's not cool. <laughs> The other thing that occurs is dentation. So our gums change. We get receding gum lines. We get dry mouth, tooth decay, tooth loss. So I don't know if you guys have ever heard the, the terminology. Somebody is long in the tooth. That basically means they've aged and they've lost their gums. No, their teeth didn't grow. Yes, they've lost some of their gums. Never heard that? I, I have heard the expression, but now I know what it means. Long in the tooth, it means you have a receding gums. 
Got you. Learning so much from I know we've this. got prostate, we've got gums. What's next? <laughs> no jumping on trampolines, guys. After 20, don't do it. <laughs> we also know about our integumentary system. You know what? I can't. I should have done some research on how much money we spend in general on beautification products because our skin loses its elasticity. We lose some fat in our in our skin as well. Our oils change. All of that, we become drier. How do I know this? Because I look in the mirror with my glasses and I'm like, oh, what happened? Who did this with this wrinkly skin, these age spots, and some really weird skin growths that happened to occur? <laughs> <laughs> See, you didn't know it was all about me, but it actually is. So we also know that there's weight gain. So again, you look in the mirror and you go, where did that come from? Our metabolism slows down. Things are just not the same. We've decreased our activity level. So that's basically part of normal aging. And sexuality. This one I'm not going to talk about me, but apparently <laughs> we do lose our libido, our drive, have some dryness, erectile dysfunction, all of those kinds of things that go along with that. Okay. But there are ways to do some healthy aging as well. And so, yep, we've got our normal aging process. But guess what? If we do a few things, we might be able to work on our healthy aging. So nutrition, fruits, vegetables, nuts, um, whole grains, lean meat, all of those kinds of things can help with our aging process. Hydration, this one's kind of cool. Normally you hear about 64 ounces of water is what the recommended dosage. And actually for men, it's 124 ounces per day, but that's not necessarily water. That's also inclusive of, um, I mean, you can include coffee, believe it or not, because it's got water in it. So really it's any fluid intake. So for women, it's 92 ounces. Who in this room actually gets 92 ounces a day of fluids? I'm impressed. <laughs> Sure, though. Wow, Tammy, I'm not sure I believe you on that one, but okay. <laughs> How about men, 124 ounces? Can you get 124 yeah, it's ounces? five bottles. It's hard, but yes, wow. I'm working on it. Wow, that's but impressive. It's a challenge. That's, that's really impressive. We also have to think about our physical activity. So healthy aging, we've talked a, l a lot about this just in general, about physical activity. But the ACSM, which is the American College of Sports Medicine, actually recommends, and so does the CDC, recommends that we have 150 minutes of moderate aerobic activity per week, which could be like 30 minutes a day, five times a week, and that we also have twice a week of strength training. Who in this room gets at least 150 minutes per week of, <laughs> sorry, Tammy, put your hand down, um, gets 150 minutes of aerobic exercise each week? Come on, get them higher. That's impressive, good job. How about two times a week of strength training? All right, you all look pretty young in this room, right? So it's like, now let's think about aging. Yeah. Okay, we also know that socially, it's incredibly important with our healthy aging that we hang out with our people, that we're social. That, you're gonna talk a lot more about that, but I mean, I can briefly touch on this one, but when we think socially, I mean, it increases your quality of life, being able to have those social touch points. But also socially, the more that we engage, the more that we actually um, slow down the cognitive decline by 70% apparently. We work on memory, we work on reducing our stress, and it reduces our isolation. And the other thing too is thinking about having cognitive stimulation. So. We know how important that is that we're doing things like brain games. We're changing our routine. We even just know that from a neuroplastic principles, right? We've got to be able to have variations so that our brain can change and be around that. Um, so hobbies, volunteerism, music, all of those things are what keep us lovely and healthy. So. When we put all those things together, we need to think about whatever our physical health benefits are. So if we're doing activity, we actually can actually improve our life expectancy. We can improve our physical fitness. We can um, actually prevent primary and secondary long-term effects. That's a, that's a good thing. We can actually sleep better. Sleep is incredibly important, especially as you age. 
it's important now too, but especially as you age, and also weight loss. But then when we also think about our mental health benefits, um, you know, when you're mentally healthy, you have an improved body image, you have improved at, um, attitude towards your physical activity, you have improved participation in, um, in socialization, so you're reducing your isolation. You have improved confidence, self-esteem, improved mood, and reduced risk of depression. So those are all the really great things. So we have normal aging, healthy aging, but now we've had a neurological infarct deficit. Something's happened. Yeah. Some kind of brain injury, right? So... <clears throat> So now we talk about brain injury. So what does a brain injury in, in affect, right? Um, everything. Everything that we just talked about for normal and aging um, is affected by your brain injury, depending on, you know, how, um, like how, how bad your brain injury was, right? So we're going to talk about cognition, your physical function, your senses, your communication, behavior, emotions, um, sexual dysfunction, um, all of those things. Uh, play effect in normal aging, but then also brain injury. So now we've exacerbated all of this normal aging. Um, the length of time it takes to get to where normal aging is is now condensed. Um, we're going to see some of those things that we would generally see in an 80-year-old, maybe in a 50-year-old, depending on the level of their brain injury. Um, <clears throat> it's also, I mean, that there's that piece of it. There's also the piece that you're gonna to continue to get better, right? So initially, you've got your brain injury, you figure out where your functional level is, you work with these lovely therapists here, they help get you to a much functional, a better functional level, and then, again, things start to decline, and that happens a little bit more rapidly for some people. Um, degenerative effects that have been uh, proven as a byproduct of brain injury just because they happen to break down the brain cells are then you're thinking of increased risk for dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, um, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, okay? So all of those things are then going to exacerbate all of those normal aging functions. So talking about stats on brain injury, who's got them, who's got it? Um, <clears throat> I didn't go as in-depth as what um, Gail was talking about earlier, looking at Parkinson's, MS, all of the neurological diseases as well. But just looking at um, brain injury, um, CDC tells us there's probably about 5.3 million individuals in the U.S. living with permanent brain injury uh, related disability, uh, which is about one in 60 people. Uh, the CDC estimates at least 1.7 million Americans sustain a TBI each year. Um, and more than 795,000 people in the U.S. have a stroke. 610 of those are new strokes, um, and nearly one in four of those that, that have a stroke have had a previous stroke. So <clears throat> um, just thinking about that at like a base level, um, if you're someone who's had a stroke, who then has another stroke, um, all of those normal aging functions that everyone usually goes through are now going to be exacerbated even more, right? Um, that, that level that you're able to get to, how long are you able to sustain it now? Um, because everything is just gonna kind of break down a little bit quicker than it normally would. <clears throat> um, and then that also leads to any neurological condition you have, you're at an increased risk for falls. Um, and every time you have a fall, then that again increases, you know, how bad is that fall? Does that put you back in rehab? Does that then take away some more of your abilities um, and just impacts that normal aging function again. Um, so then we kind of talk about aging and medicine, right? So what does that look like? As Gail touched on, um, your artery walls are, th are thickening, um, all that fun stuff, right? So now we're talking about polypharmacy, um, adding in medications that maybe you never had to take before, Maybe now you're on blood thinners. Maybe now you're on blood pressure meds. Maybe now you've got diabetes. Um, all of these things increase your risk for brain injury, increase your risk for stroke. But also, if you've already had a stroke, now they increase it even more. 
Um, so it, it just, it's more wear and tear on your body as you're going through. You also um, have to think about how many times you get a physician with our silos, your <laughs> cardiac physician and your neurologist and your PCP and your whoever over here are all prescribing medicine, like you said, from a polypharmacy standpoint. But what's the potential adverse effect on our people with brain injury, even just from a normal aging standpoint, but now add in the neurological infarct and what kind of devastation that can do with that polypharmacy because people aren't talking. Right, and, and with that, you're not able to adequately tell those physicians exactly what's happening. So now we're making guesses about what's happening and what's correct dosing and what's helping you be comfortable. Um, another thing that comes up with this is misdosing and incorrect dosing. Um, so again, sometimes the physicians kind of have to take a guess at what the correct dosing looks like, but also, can you manage, uh, with a brain injury, can you manage those medications on your own? Or do we need to try and make sure that somebody is there to help you manage that? Um, and what, depending on what your injury is, what all your comorbidities are, um, how detrimental is it if you're missing that dose? What does that do for you? Yep. At some point, we'll let Jeremy speak, but <laughs> you'll just have to wait. I have two ears, so I'd rather listen. <laughs> okay, so really I want to talk about, you know, let's talk about aging and, and therapeutic. I could go on and on and on and on forever. I think one of the things that's really important is that we're recognizing that any neurological infarct now, what we really need to think of it is, is the chronicity of the, the deficits or the chronicity of the infarct. Similar to like if you hurt your low back, right? You're probably always going to have a chronic low back condition. And how do you end up living your life with your chronic low back condition? So we need to think of our people having chronic or chronicity, which is exactly what Jeff and Rick were talking about a little bit earlier, is the longevity of people living with, with brain injury. And how do we treat them and what do we do? So I think those are, that's really important in our care of our individuals is to think of the chronic nature of what they're dealing with. Um, Laura pointed out in her SCI discussion, really talking about those understanding the secondary impairments. And, and what does that mean? So, okay, fine, you, you, you had an infarct, but now you've had spasticity that has led to incredibly tight muscles that has now has a chronically subluxed shoulder and how do we manage and deal with all of that? And then also, how does that relate into the aging process? Because now you're moving slower, you can't do the things that you wanna do, or you can't do your cardiovascular activity. Oh yeah, and your arteries have already hardened, and you already had heart disease before, but you have blood pressure, right? So it keeps going on. So it's really understanding all of those secondary impairments range of motion, strength, but all the other things that just come along and, tri and add on to it and trickle to it. I think it's really important to also understand the journey of, we have everybody in our, um, who wants to be independent. Nobody says, I want someone to take care of me. Nobody says, signs up for that. And I think it's important that we understand everybody wants to be independent but what happens when you lose your independence? What happens when your role changes? What happens when you have to change your housing? So maybe you can't go back to your two story and you're living with your kids, or maybe you're having to move into an apartment, or maybe you have to go to a group home or assisted living or long-term care, as Josie and Aaron mentioned. So I think it's important for us as from a therapeutic standpoint to understand those kinds of components as well. I think it's really important to recognize that our senses change, touch, smell, taste, we already talked about hearing, sight, but all of those change. And then what happens when you have somebody who's had a CVA with really, really bad visual deficits and what that does to their world and what that does to your ability to get out and about or socialize or read or do your brain games and what the effect that has on individuals. So it's important to understand this, the senses as well. I think it's incredibly uh, important to understand that the chemical changes that have occurred in the brain and that the chemical changes that continue to occur in the brain with cell loss, 
right? So who you were at 30 on certain kinds of meds that might have been your mood stabilizers, maybe don't work at 35 with a brain injury. Maybe they don't work at 45 with a brain injury. And it's important to understand those chemical changes and the chemical processes and always be reevaluating those as well. You're not the same brain injury, neuro infarct at 60 as you are at 85. Probably the bigger thing, um, I think, from a therapeutic standpoint is understanding that those with their chronicity, we need to make sure that we're doing episodic care. Now, throughout the day, you probably heard that a little bit, but episodic care to us means that we continue to travel the journey with our individuals throughout their lifespan. So throughout this entire aging process with BI, they're continuing to come back to see us year over year. Maybe initially it's six months after they, they discharge from outpatient. Maybe it's then a year later they come back. Maybe it's nine months, but they come back. So similar to Brian, when I asked the question, I do still work here by the way. Um, when I asked the question about when is he gonna come back, he looks great, right? He is exercising at this adaptive wellness thing and he's doing really well but he has secondary impairments related to that tight arm. He's going to continue over the aging process, have potential hip back issues or any kind of issues. And so it's important that we continue with our episodic care, even with somebody like Brian who looks so good and who's doing so well. You can talk now. Yeah. Wow. I was zoning off. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I thank you both for actually um, putting the meat and potatoes of this together. Um, so first thing you have to know is at Alma with Life in Glenwood, uh, we've been kind of aimed at our, a younger adult population. Um, we, we only have a small population of individuals um, over 65. I'd say there's uh, three to four currently that we're serving. Um, but with that short time working with these individuals, I have learned um, a couple things, and I've, I've seen some... Uh, commonalities. And so that's what I was going to kind of talk about. And one of the biggest things is that this isn't a shocker. I, I went to a conference four years ago and there was a topic on uh, the baby boomer generation and how that's going to change the therapy needs. And really the take home was that there's a drive to be independent. Um, and uh, I can understand that. And, and we've seen that play out to where um, individuals that I serve that are over 60 are less likely to participate in our TR activities. Um, they are less likely to participate in group activities. Um, they are less likely to participate in new activities. Um, and that's, that's really been a challenge um, because we know that the social isolation just leads to more social isolation, right? So it doesn't make our job any easier. Um, some of the other factors to consider why we've seen, seen this trend is, uh, I'm not picking on my other therapists here, but there's less education on the benefits of TR in general. Uh, if you look at it, and you look at today, we've had a lot of focus on physical therapy, exercise, things of that nature, because it's awesome, right? Couldn't, where would we be without all of that? Right. So there is a little less education. Um, some of our members make it a priority to go to their PT session. That's very important to that member. But as a rec therapist, I could offer them the same thing under the direction of a PT. No, I'm just saying that we have PTs that we work closely with that will say, hey, um, we could turn this exercise into a TR-related exercise, right? We're achieving the same outcome, different. And they won't attend this because it's not physical therapy. Um, and sometimes what we can do to combat that is just, of course, educate them that, uh, hey, we can still do physical activity, we can still do um, speech therapy, we can still do occupational therapy in a TR setting. Um, but it does take a little more education. And I'll get into some of that a little bit um, more on here. Uh, of course, older adults are feeling more prone to loneliness because of the social isolation. And one of the um, the facts I found said that social isolation for eight hours or more has been shown to correlate to a decrease in energy. We have seen an energy drop off in a number of our folks um, as they age and they quit participating in some of the things that they normally would. You see this fatigue set in. And um, normally, that's what we're combating is that fatigue, um, that 
low energy. It's not that they don't maybe like the idea of participating in some of this, they just don't have the energy to do it. And we know with our population as that um, decreases, of course, aphasia and other things increase. Oh, yep. I know I look cool, calm, and collected, but on the inside, this is it's not my thing, so <laughs> I appreciate you guys. Um, so what are some of the possible strategies? Uh, Brian touched on this earlier. Um, we have to find things that are very important to them. Uh, if P90X is uh, a preferred activity, then we have to be willing to adapt that, right? We have to be willing to look for ways to find um, an outlet. Yet, yeah, even though we can't participate in the same DVD program, what can we find out there? How can we adapt this model that they have? And uh, just to give you an example, we have a gentleman we serve. He's over his 60s. Um, he was very driven um, in all of his therapies except for TR. And then he got a, a doctor had told him one day that he wasn't going to walk again. And so next thing you know, he just pulled back from almost all of his therapies. And uh, it was kind of sad because he uh, really had a lot of abilities. And so in talking to him, you know, we found out that kayaking was something that was very important to him. And we've used him as a case study before, but um, it was like, okay, well, if this is important to you, we have a lot of steps to get you back on the water, um, but what can we do? And so then we looked at it uh, collaboratively with the team and said, all right, um, how can we make this work? And so the gentleman spent well over a year um, in therapies to get to that goal. And uh, it, it, was, it was beneficial, you know, he, he didn't want to do anything else but either walk or kayak. And well, since walking was taken off the plate, then I guess we were left with kayaking. Um, I have another gentleman who uh, is interested in speaking, okay? So um, he's been kind of told by the doctor, you're never going to walk again. So all of a sudden those physical activities kind of, they lose interest to some of our folks. Um, but the speech one was important, but he didn't want to attend community events. He didn't want to attend um, small group therapies. It was either one-on-one -on -one or nothing at all. So we decided, well, why can't we just incorporate your speech therapy in everything that we do? And so we did that. And the next thing you know, he's attending um, our group therapies again. And uh, so that's kind of really the takeaway on this is that You've got to really be willing to find something that is very important to the individual. If, um, if they're having a hard time getting out of their house, if they're having a hard time getting out of their bed, if they're having a hard time getting out of their room, um, my suggestion is find the time that works best for them. Obviously, they're dealing with low energy. Um, we need to figure out what is the best time for them to attend. And then we need to find out what is interesting enough for them that they will attend. And what I found um, with this is that once they start attending one small group, and hopefully it snowballs into another, and you start seeing them around at the party that we had, and so it grows, you know, it slowly decreases, and you can slowly increase it. Sometimes that's not enough. Then what do you do? Well, that's where you turn to friends and family of the person you're serving. Um, sometimes they can give you a key that maybe you're missing that the person served didn't think about or forgot about, or maybe they can light a fire under them for you. And um, that's been effective. Sometimes um, just educating the family with what we're seeing, what we, our desired outcomes are, and ask them to give them a little nudge. Next thing you know, that person's at the next, the next therapy session that you have. Um, so basically, you know, just start with what they know and then grow from there. If someone is really good at something or highly interested in something or it was a favorite pastime and you're not getting any um, participation in any other rec or leisure programs, do everything you can to just start with w what they do know and what they want to work on and let it build from there. Okay, so we thought about case studies because we want to just give a prime example. And as I put the word up there, Eileen 511, probably everybody from Al knows exactly who I'm talking about. And do what? Go Eileen, yeah. 
For those that don't know who Eileen is, Eileen um, is pretty much the poster child for On With Life and for all of our services that we offer at On With Life, to be totally frank. Um, she's pretty much hit every single one of our services. So to give you a little backstory on Eileen, um, she had an aneurysm rupture at the age of 23, caused a lot of injury. Um, from that, she's actually now 56, so that's 33 years of, of living with brain injury. So as we talk about aging with brain injury, she's a really good example um, kind of for like what the trajectory and, and what ended up happening with her. But she's called the 511 because she was actually the fifth person served to ever be admitted in inpatient in 1991. She's super proud of that. So she, she'll rock that. Um, she also was one of the first people to get onto the BI brain, in, the brain injury waiver, which is super cool because that allowed her to have um, SCL services and a whole bunch of other services as well. And I believe she was one of the first people, and this one I get a little confused, so correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the first people to get the SCL services through On With Life. Sound good? Yep. Social work, shake your head, sounds good. Um, and she was also one of the first people to live at our Owl Creek Apartments, which is actually a, um, a HUD subsidized low-income housing um, that is on our property at On With Life. There are 10, I believe, independent apartments. And within that, most people do receive some sort of services. So for Eileen, she actually was receiving um, SEL and home care services. So for many, many years, Eileen was able to live independently in the Owl Creek Apartments. She had SCL services, so supported community living services through On With Life. And we were her family. I mean, like, well, she had family, don't get me wrong, but she's an owl girl, no doubt, right? <laughs> right? She's an owl girl. Oh, yeah. She, she might as well have worn that shirt, owl girl. Superpower. But because of her injury, she was dependent for driving, dependent for her medication management. She did need an assistance of a bath aid. She ambulated in the home independently with an AFO. Not pretty. Woo! Not pretty. But she did it for sure. She would need assistance for things like her home exercise program, groceries, laundry, those kinds of things. But really survived pretty darn well for a number of years well, 33, so basically about 32, 30, maybe 30, did really, really well for 30 years doing her thing. Very, very active, very, very social in the community, and very talkative. <laughs> so here's little Miss Sassy, Eileen. <laughs> And if you see that big old grin, that's pretty much how she lives her life, with that big, cheesy grin all the time. Goofy hats, you know, loving her SCLs, loving her staff, loving any time that she came back to outpatient for her episodic care, because that for sure happened over the years. And also, occasionally, she'd come visit inpatient. Yeah, a couple times. Yeah, a couple times. But we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But to know Eileen is to know that... <laughs> Anytime you meet her, one, she's going to ask you, what's your birthday? She's also going to ask you if you're Catholic. If you are Catholic, she wants to know what your Catholic baptized name is, right? Yes. <laughs> Confirmation name, excuse me. Yep. So she's going to ask you all these things. So a delight, living, living really, really well with lots of support and services through her BI, through her brain injury. Anything bad? No, not to lie. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. I, got, I got stuff, but okay. not yet. Right. So I said she lived really well for about good 30 years, and really over the last three or four years, there's been a significant decline. That decline was related to several hospitalizations, um, and some of the hospitalizations were related to, oh, many of them were related to falls. Many of them were related to needing to use the bathroom in the middle of the night, her balance is off. She's not wearing an AFO. Uh-oh, she has a UTI, so she's definitely got to use the bathroom a lot quicker. Did well during the day with supportive services, but doesn't have supportive services in the evening. But um, 
those things led her to come back to On With Life for inpatient, a couple of stays, and also back to outpatient for a couple of stays. But we did have a fall that led to a humeral fracture. And that really, I think, from an On With Life staff standpoint, was probably when I noticed it the most, was that particular admission that she had, she had aged and aged pretty quickly because of, I mean, well, because of things going on, because of the aging with BI, but because of UTIs, falls, and then this significant decline that got her back into a wheelchair, and then the decline that happened from that. Yeah, I, that? I agree with that. Um, I mean, her coming to stay after, um, the, she ended up with three inpatient stays, I think, mm -hmm. right? Um, following the, the leg fracture and then two more stays after that, pretty, pretty quickly after that, um, related to falls. And it, every time she came in, I mean, you still saw she was still the same person, um, still bubbly, still wanted to know everything about you. Everything. Um, <laughs> but, uh, she just, she struggled more and more to see her own deficits um, and to understand that while also um, really displaying this like learned helplessness, right? So depending heavily on staff, but also stating that she didn't need any help at all and just kind of um, with this understanding that she was just going to go back to live where she was living before and everything was going to be fine. Um, but it, it, we tried it and... Yeah, I mean, and really... Uh, I don't know if we talk about this a little bit later, so I don't want to get totally ahead. I mean, we can if we need to. We're kind of blending two slides yeah, that's here, fine, but that's whatever. Fine. We're blending, just like my my um, pants and your hair. Yep. With Jeremy in between. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what Bree is talking about with the cognitive changes, I mean, really lack of insight. And I think that was one of the things that was more evident as well. I mean, we all have known her for a number of years. And again, like living safely, but on this, on this hill, like this rock on the hill that has the potential to fall down the valley. And that's really, I think, what we saw was this teeter, unstable rock. But as it did fall, it got stuck in the well. Yeah. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of impulsivity as well. So mm -hmm. the most recent last inpatient stay um, was October of 21 to um, pretty much the end of February of 22. And then we had um, episodic or outpatient care, episodic care that lasted from March of 22 to August of 22. So, what so with her last inpatient stay, um, there's definitely an increase in uh, medication needs um, kind of related to those continued falls and kind of just a decline in general, um, <clears throat> which again, with all medication, all medications, there's a, um, an increased side effects, right? More medications, more side effects, all those, all those fun things kind of go hand in hand. Um, it's also more important that there's a timely delivery of this. Now, Eileen was very specific about when she needed her medication. She was very regimented in this. So in that fact, she was fine, but um, it's just something that we have to kind of look forward, like work people with, work on with people. Um, from a therapeutic standpoint, again, there's that learned helplessness. Um, so there was increased impulsivity, decreased insight, um, this learned helplessness, where she was just depending on staff, but also stating um, in, in the same sentence that she was gonna be going back to living independently. Um, so it was just kind of continuing, um, therapy had to continue to push her physical um, limitations and try and continue to push her back to where she was before, but then there was almost in her last stay, this like kind of push back from her that like she didn't, she didn't need to continue to work on this, like she was fine where she was at. Um, I know many times um, down in the nursing department, it would be a struggle for staff to try and get her AFO on, which she was going to walk. She was going to walk to the bathroom. Um, but PT had specifically told us that AFO needs to be on if she's walking. So there's this constant push-pull with her on that. Um, and then, you know, as, as Gail touched on, she was very active um, just in any capacity that she could be. Um, well, now we've got more limitations. So how active can we be at this point? Um, she wasn't able to go back to living independently. She went 
um, a, to live at a host home for a while. And I think it was under the assumption that she, she wasn't really as bad as, as she thought she was. Oh, about say, in her brain, yes. Yes, yeah, in right. her brain, yeah. right. So there were, you know, in, in her head it, it wasn't, it wasn't as bad, um, but they kind of quickly found that it wasn't working out. Um, yeah, and I would say, I mean, for any of the OWL staff who know her, but just in general, you know, <laughs> we always feel like we know best, right? But in looking at Eileen and in looking at her level of ind independence, for years, for years, you could basically say she loved to socialize. I mean, loved to socialize, loved to be active. And so, like, a group home would have been a, a wonderful place for her to be with roommates so that she could be social, they could go do things, they, she could be well-supported. But in Eileen's mind... She did not want to live in a group home. She did not want to live in an assisted living. And for sure, she didn't need long-term care. But she didn't need to live in those environments because she wasn't old. And she wasn't that bad. So she would only go to those places if she was old and that bad. And she wasn't. And so the discharge plan, actually, from our in, the inpatient stay was really, really rocky because she refused to go to different places that we could have potentially got her into because of her idea of what her independence was, even though she needed a lot of help. So her idea of, of how she needed to be, wanted to be living limited her ability to get potentially in a better environment. She did, as Bree said, go to a host home where at this point she is, is relatively wheelchair bound only because she's so impulsive and also has really lost a lot of balance. And by losing a lot of balance, the host home person who was supposed to be giving 24 hours a day and the facility or the, what's it, the, the managing, uh, the mosaic, what is that? A, a company, whatever. A, sure, sounds good. <laughs> whatever. They also had relatively unrealistic expectations of what her abilities were. And so we had a mismatch of us saying she needs 24-hour assistance, not like looking at, like physical hands-on because her balance is so impaired. But they didn't understand that. Their goal was to try to work her toward two to three hours of independence a day where the host home person could leave and she could either call or when she needed to be with the person or needed the person, she could ring a bell. That ain't going to happen. She was impulsive. No, no, no. And that impulsivity within the host home actually caused her to fall several times in the host home, get re-injured again on her wrist, and it was just a bad situation. But because Eileen continued to disagree with sort of her living situation, we ended up having to have a um, conference with uh, the total Iowa Total Care case manager with the leaders of the Mosaic Home, with the group host home person, with all three of her sisters. And at that point, I had to explain aging and brain injury because her sisters didn't even necessarily see it. They didn't quite understand why she had changed so dramatically within the three to four years. And so it was those other tough conversations of things that we have to do as healthcare providers to help them understand what happens with aging. So ultimately, Eileen now is as with another host home, but she actually has two providers that are there 24 hours a day that are able to give her the assistance that she needs. Unfortunately, by her going to the host home, she did lose her SCL services through On With Life, and that was another big bummer for her, and one of the reasons she never wanted to leave the Owl Creek Apartments is because of the bond that she had created with us. So that was really tough. All right, um, that, that pretty much sums up what we have. So if anybody has questions for us at all, um, anything that we can answer for you? Abby's. Oh, Abby's coming with the mic. Yeah, Abby, four mic. <laughs> Eileen was standing in the dark right by your office, Angie, by the door in the dark. And I was coming through with doing, leaving after what I did. And all I heard was Sherry. <laughs> and I like to made a sunroof out of that Owl Creek Apartments. And I turned on the light and there stood Eileen's 
scared me to death. But that's the kind of person she was. She was so, she could make you laugh. She could, she's so full of love. And we do miss her. Um, I would say that's pretty typical. That's funny. That's really good. <laughs> Any other questions related to... Just, just another observation. Um, we all loved her that worked with her. Um, she, uh, she was so good at memorizing birthdays that she called them in so frequently that the local radio station banned her. Some of us, I remember she would call some of us and uh, leave, uh, she would sing us happy birthday on our voicemails um, at work. She had them written down. She'd hand you her planner and say, write down your birthday and your phone number so I can call you. Isn't that hilarious? What other questions for this group? I really think that, um, Abby, we need to be making some owl girl shirts, though, like in, you know, celebration of Eileen. In brand colors only. Yeah. Thank you guys. We appreciate this so much. Um, uh, before you clap, hold up. Hold up. I just would like to say, um, a give, give, give a huge, huge, huge thank you to Abby. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Abby. Yep. She's worked her tail off for this. I mean, there are some people on the committee, but we barely did anything. Abby's done it all. Um, it's so much appreciated. Very, very good. Yep. And uh, thank you guys for coming. Thanks. Okay, just a few really quick things before we get you on your way. Um, is Joelle from Mary Greeley here? Last call for Joelle, otherwise I'm going to grab a different... Oh, oh that's, not, that's not you. Erin <laughs> said that was her. She'd take it for her. Okay, I am going to have one of you ladies draw me two cards, please. Okay, uh, Michelle Fuller, Mercy Rehab Hospital. Okay, well, Michelle wins a free conference next year, a free conference registration next year, and this one's going to win the Texas Roadhouse gift card. Uh, Dolores Mindrup. Wonderful, we'll get that over to you. Um, thank you all so much for coming today. This is always such a, a fun day when we get to get providers in the room together and learn about what's new in brain injury. For those of you online, please complete your survey. That's our cue to know that you watch the entire day. That's how you get your certificate. So if you are online, please complete your survey. If you are in person, you have a yellow survey in your folder. You may complete that and drop it at the registration table, or you may complete it online if you'd like, um, if that's easier for you. And please remember to sign out on your way. Drive safely, and we hope to see you at a future On With Life event.